Hello, in this video I'll primarily be going over a uh, first in introduction to installation of Linux in a virtual machine and then uh, while the virtual machine is uh, is installing I'll be going over a few topics about int enterprise Linux distributions, a bit about virtual machines, um, about the, op the uh, system we're using and, and uh, some basic uh, Linux desktop customizations once we're done. The uh, majority of the video though will be going through the tools needed to do the, the first virtual machine installation at home. The idea is that you, we can get you set up as quickly as possible with your own little sandbox at home you can play around with, you can blow it away, you can recreate it, you can snapshot it, you do all sorts of things to to uh, play around without actually damaging a real system or not, being, not uh, risking being without um, access to a working computer while uh, the uh, while we're playing around with these uh, these toys and skills and applications and things. So the first thing you want to do is go to the uh, VirtualBox website. I've uh, I've used VirtualBox quite a bit over the years, just uh, just um, particularly in Windows and, and Mac OS environments. Uh, these days, Linux has its own KVM virtualization system built in. That, that's what I'll be using for the for the majority of the video series I'll be creating. But uh, for the this the purpose of this one, VirtualBox um, is one of the more accessible cross-platform uh, virtualization software applications, and it is available as it says here. It's available on Windows, Linux, and Mac, and Solaris as well. And um, it can you can run a whole lot of things on it. So to get started, we'll just get you if you click on the download link on this page, it takes you to their list of download pages, uh, download applications, and you just pick the version of the operating system you're running. Most likely you, if you're running Windows at home on your home computer, you can download and install this without, um, yeah, so you can, we can use Linux without damaging the operating system you're using already. It just runs in a little bubble while and only uses resources while you actually have it running. Once you've got this downloaded and uh, start the installation process, and just double click the installer and go through the uh, the checkboxes. The next thing you want to do is download your Linux installation disks. For the purpose of this series we're going to be working primarily with CentOS Linux so if you go to the centos.org website and uh, click on this get CentOS now button they've got on the front page it um, takes you to a couple of download links for uh, downloading the just the CentOS Linux DVD so this is the just the base DVD it has um, you can install a graphical server or cut down server or graphical desktop from that one. That's the one that uh, I've downloaded, ready to get started on the first uh, on the first uh, Linux install. And here we have the Oracle VM VirtualBox Manager. So this is the application we're going to be using just to to create a couple of VMs and play around with them. Just go through some of the basics of virtualization. So we'll click on the new button here and just go through the process of creating a new virtual machine. You've got to give the virtual machine a name. This doesn't actually impact the uh, running OS at all. This is just a label so you can see it in the list here and start and stop the correct one. For the, the purposes of this um, naming convention I'm using at the moment is JAT for James Yackel Tutorials and then a little bit about the version that's running so we know what it is. It's uh, CentOS Linux 8 and this is going to be a desktop system so I'll just call it desktop. 001, so we can have up to a thousand of these before I start running into problems. Uh, the place it's going to put it is just on my home directory in under VirtualBox VM. It's going to create a folder there. Uh, this one is going to be a Linux system. Um, CentOS is most similar to Red Hat Linux, so we we'll just go Red Hat 64-bit. This is just so uh, to tell it what defaults to use when setting up, because um, Linux and, and and Windows might have different preferred. Uh, uh, you know, starting RAM and disk and and uh, other settings. How much RAM? Um, I'm going to create it with one gig of RAM. When you actually run it, I'll give it two, but I'll just use this as a learning process of how to go on changing this. This is basically when the operating system runs within the Oracle VM uh, VirtualBox application. This is what how much RAM it'll see, and so it, it thinks it's got you know it's its own computer with one gig of RAM and um, you can sort of keep it in its box then it can't use any more than that and you can run if you're running multiple virtual machines you can see I've, I've got about 12 in this 12 gig in this box so one gig isn't going to be too much of an imposition but um, I can then run up to sort of 12 before they start impacting each other or start having to reclaim memory 
hard disks. So for this one, I'll I'll just go. I'll probably actually bump that up a little bit rather than go with uh, eight gig. I'll probably go about twelve or so, just so it's got a little bit of extra room. I can install some ap applications and things on it. But um, for a for a, a, a command line only system, eight gigs probably fine. We'll go through. It's asking what file format to use. We'll just choose the uh, default, the virtual box disk image. This is a this VMDK is a um, format used by by VMware, which is going to be much more common, and you probably want to pick that if you're going to be moving back and forth between VMware products and, and this, but for the purpose of this, uh, VDI is fine. Uh, dynamically allocated versus fixed size, so th basically if you choose fixed size it'll create the full sort of 12 gigabyte file, and that's what it'll appear as on your hard disk, you see the um, 12 gig file. If you go dynamically allocated, the operating system will see it as a 12 gig file, but it won't actually fill up the disk until you start doing installations and putting things on, and actually putting data on there. This is asking uh, where we're going to put it, and it's in that, it's in my home folder in uh, VirtualBox VMs folder, and there a folder named the same the PC, and the just the uh, VDI file with the same name again. So you put multiple files in there later on if we're adding uh, more, and I'll give it, um, oops. 23, 12. Create that. So here we are. We've got uh, our VM set up that it hasn't been uh, booted up yet. It's, you can just go through and have a look at what, what uh, systems and what what bits of hardware they've attached to it. Sort of, you can set the boot order as though it was a, a real, you know, real bit of hardware. You can change it between the uh, CD versus the hard disk, and you can put network in there as well. This has got, um, it's detected that the uh, the CPU I've got has got um, virtualization acceleration on there. Uh, what have we got here? Some, okay, some display settings, things you can change that. Storage, what type of controller it was using and how it's adding it. So it's got the um, the CD-ROM drive or the virtual CD-ROM drive set up as, a, as an IDE disk, whereas the uh, hard disk is appearing as a SATA. Uh, it's feeding through Pulse Audio on, this, on my box for audio output. Uh, what sort of network adapter it's using? It's it's simulating a uh, Intel Pro 1000 MT uh, network card, and you can see it's it's natted behind the machine. So I'll go through that in a bit more detail later on. But um, for the purpose of this, that essentially means that the computer will be able to get to the internet, get out of the network, uh, but it will be using my desktop, the the machine that it's uh, the physical machine it's running on, as a gateway router so it won't be visible to the rest of the network but it can still get to the outside world and shared folders you can set up things like shared folders so the uh, the operating system sees a folder on your hard disk and and you can write back and forth uh, what I was going to do is I'll just go in and edit the system settings here and instead of 1024 we'll call it uh, 2048 give it 2 gig of RAM being a a um, desktop or a graphical system, it's best to give it a little bit more and processor, it's got one vCPU, best to give it two. If you're running a graphical system you find if there's one then any application you do, you're installing or any anything that's going on in the background that's chewing up a lot of CPU resources will start impacting your user interface so it's a good idea to create, just add two there. You can go through and you can see you can modify settings for any other uh, bits of virtual hardware that's attached. So that will do. When I started up the first time, it'll ask me where that CentOS ISO file I saved was, and I, I just saved it. I created a folder called Vert ISO on my machine, and that's where the CentOS 8 install disk is. So we'll click through that and start that. So here it is booting up for the first time. This is what you'd see if you were booting off a CD on a physical box. Uh, the test media and install CentOS Linux is um, that basically goes through and does a scan of the, of the disk media and make sure it's not damaged uh, but since we just downloaded it as an ISO we're not going to worry about that on here and so we're going to select install CentOS Linux 8 and this will go and start up the installer now put a little notice up here about capturing the keyboard the uh, capturing the, um, the mouse so what what this is telling us is essentially if, if I click in here it'll steal my mouse and now I'm moving my mouse around you can't see the cursor until I hit the right control button. Different um, virtualization software uses different button keys, sometimes you have to press control alt to make it let go, 
uh, control shift on some, but um, on VirtualBox it's right control, so that releases your mouse back again. And we'll see it goes through the boot up process here, eventually we'll get a graphical sort of display. Oh, here we go, there's a mouse come up within the system. And this is going to go through the standard installation options. The first thing you've got to choose is what your language you're using, what sort of keyboard you're you're using. I'll go with English Australia. And it just takes a moment to come up. Here we go. Now this is the the uh, next series of questions you'll be asked. What sort of keyboard you're using? Language support. We've already been through that. Time and date. <coughs> in this one, you can set you know, wherever you are in the world, obviously. So we'll just uh, for this one, we'll just pick there, and we go network time. Um, this is currently set to off because the network's not connected yet, and we'll get through that in a later setting. If I try and turn it off, it just goes off. Uh, turn it on, it goes off again. If you click on here, you can see a list of let's say a pool of NTP servers. This is to go out. NTP is network time protocol. This is just to reach out, find a, a uh, clock on the internet, and try and set the local time on the machine to that. And if I hit done on here, it'll take us back to the screen. Now go through software, uh, installation source. You can set up other installation sources. Uh, we won't do that for now. Um, this is basically you can set up network sources. So it tells your computer when doing the app application install you'll actually go out to the internet and or go out to the network or somewhere like that and get the updates as you're doing the installation. That's um, useful later on when we're doing network installs but for, for now for doing a standalone single we're just going to install straight off the CD and we'll um, do updates and things from the network later on. Software selection. So the default here is server with GUI and you've got these other options of add-ons you can add to that. Uh, we're not going to add any of these to the uh, for the time being, but there's um, these are basically package sets, so you can get a whole lot of different packages installed on there. Uh, server is basically the same as this, but without the uh, without the GUI on it, without the graphical interface, you'll um, get a command line system if you click on that one. Minimal install is basically the server, but with less stuff installed. Uh, workstation is probably more similar to the server with GUI, but if we have a look in there, you'll see we've got things like the um, email, chat and video conferencing software, you've got the office suite in there, that's the LibreOffice uh, suite and other, other useful graphical and security tools, all sorts of th tools in there. Uh, custom, you've got a few options in there you can go through. Uh, virtualization host is it basically if you're planning to build a a physical box which and the intention of that physical box is just to run vi virtual machines on it then this is one you can pick. You might uh, it'd be a headless server that you then connect into from outside to manage. For the purpose of this, we'll just go serve with GUI, and won't bother to take any of those other options. At this point, it goes off to its installation sources again. And just takes a moment to to um, uh, just confirm package sets. And now, if we go down the system route, installation destination, this is where we're looking at what disks to use. See, it's found the 12 gig disk that we created before. And I usually click on custom so I can see what it's doing. We'll click the done on here. And you get here, normally there'd be a list of, of um, logical volumes or you know partitions or something like that that are in here if, if the disk has been used before. But since this is a new virtual disk, there's none of that there. So we we'll click on the create, uh, click here to create them automatically. So this gives you the default that it thinks you probably need for your system. You always need a slash boot because the uh, motherboard and, and BIOS can't read any more than about the first couple of gig on any given disk, so one gig boot partition, that's where it sticks the kernel and everything it needs to boot up. So during the boot process it loads that first, loads the kernel off there and then uses that to load root partition, which in this case it's making just under 10 gig and a, a swap partition is, or a swap volume on here. A uh, swap is basically when you run out of RAM it takes the bits that aren't actively being used at the moment and sticks them on the hard disk. Uh, different operating systems do this in different ways. Some include a swap file that you can't actually see, it might be hidden, uh, but um, Linux by default will use a swap partition or swap file that you can add in. But, um, in this case it's uh, what it's actually done is created two partitions on here uh, it's not as clear 
um, is SDA1 is the first one and SDA2 is the second one that then within SDA2 is actually created two uh, logical volumes, one for swap, one for root. You can see that through its use of LVM here, uh, what volume group it's using here and the file system running on top. So you can see this one, LVM, same volume group. And uh, you go through that, go through LVM in a bit more detail in a later video. But for now, we can choose that. If you've got a bigger hard disk, like greater than 20 gig or so, it'll start looking at swapping, uh, creating an extra slash home in here where it's your home directory. So typically, it doesn't give more than about 50 gig to, to root unless you tell it to, and then anything that's from leftover will um, go into slash home. And that's, that's where all the users' home directories go. So I'll hit done on that, and it'll come up with a list that says that it's going to destroy whatever is there at the moment. And it's going to create a new partition table on there. It's going to create the partition for SDA1, the file system on top of SDA1. It's going to create a, a partition for SDA2. <coughs> then it's going to create SDA2 as a new physical volume using LVM. Then it's create a, going to create an LVM volume group called CL. Then it's going to create a logical volume on top of that called swap, or CL dash swap. It's going to create, I format that as a swap volume. And it's going to create another logical volume in the same volume group called cl-root and it's going to format that as xfs, so x file system. And we hit accept changes. It doesn't actually write to the disk or make any of those changes until you hit the begin installation button here. Uh, Kdump usually you wouldn't worry about that on a standalone desktop system or system. It's, it's basically a uh, settings for allowing kernel dumps to a particular location of the system crashes so you can analyze them later. Network, so we're going to set up networking here. Um, we're going to give it a more interesting name than localhost.local .local domain, we'll call this JATCL8 uh, desktop 301 and for a domain name we'll call it chat.internal. This won't be externally accessible obviously, it's just uh, a um, domain name I've just made up, JAT is actually, there's an airline called JAT, so James Alcock Al Al Tutorials will have to be some other extension later on, but that'll do for now. We'll hit apply on that one. So now it's, it's got that current name there. And we're going to turn this on. And you can see it's picked up an IP address straight away. 10.0.2 is the IP address range of the internal virtual, uh, virtual machine only network that uh, the application is using. Um, you can go into more configuration details in there, but we're not going to worry about that at the moment. DHCP will do for now. Uh, hit done on there. And security policy, we're not going to worry about that at the moment, but you can actually um, go out to the internet, get security policies for rules for the system, and that then will apply them. So when you actually do the installation, it might do things like um, uh, some example rules might be about what users are allowed to do, what um, how hard disk partitions and file systems can be mounted. Um, some there's some file assurance stuff that can go into security policies. Uh, we'll be going through more on that later on anyway in a, in a more advanced video. So now we just hit the begin installation button, and uh, during this part it wants us to create a root password and create the first user. Uh, Usually, I'll use the um, use the pwmake command to come up with uh, interesting passwords. You might want to set something you can remember, uh, or um, if you've got a if you've got some sort of password manager, use pwmake. Create something relatively secure. The minimum is uh, 56 bits of entry with this program. It creates a password that looks like that. Um, or if you want to go overboard, or go bit more secure, you can go 128 bits of entropy and that creates a little bit more of a random password. But uh, for the purpose of this one I'll just go 56 and we'll create that as the root password. Oops. Root password and we'll do another one and that can be the user password. Something nice and secure, and I'll throw them into my password manager later on. But for now, we go root password here, and 
one of the reasons I like using the KVM or the, the um, virtualization that's built into Linux is uh, it has shared uh, clipboard from the beginning so you don't have to worry about typing in stuff into the VMs like this Let's see if I can get it the same Hey, like that. Hit down on there. If it doesn't like it, if you picked a, a weak password that it doesn't like, like it's got real words in it or names in it or something to do with a username in it, then it um, it uh, will force you to hit done twice before you can for it actually save the the hell out of you to use the password. Uh, for this one, I will give it. Uh, call it Jay Cook. There we go. There we go. It's come up with one for me. That'll do. And for this one, we'll go U at F A. Go with lowercase on that one. Let's see how well I get that the second time. There we go. Um, if you go to advanced you can do things like place the home directory somewhere else and give it a specific user ID and group ID. For, for, for the purpose of this we're not going to worry about that. And I'll just hit done on there and it'll take us back to here and here we go. You can see that inside them we've been talking it's installed about 130, well it's 160 there, of the, uh, the 1300 packages that are going to be installed as part of this installation process. Um, since that, uh, that's going to take a little bit longer to go ahead, I'm going to go and switch over to the PowerPoint slides that I have prepared earlier. We can uh, use to go through um, talk a little bit more about what we're doing here. So. Um, Here we go, Introduction to Linux Systems Administration. So that's what we're here for. We're going to um, go through a little bit so about uh, enterprise Linux distributions, uh, something a little bit about what a virtual machine is. We already covered that a little bit with the hands-on demonstration. Uh, Oracle VirtualBox obviously is the one we're using. First Linux installation we've got going on in the background at the moment, and then once that's done we'll go through some basic Linux desktop, uh, desktop Linux customizations. Linux distribution. So, what is a distribution? As you can see, we're installing CentOS at the moment. That's a uh, that's one of the uh, enterprise Linux family uh, distribution. They usually consist of a Linux kernel, which manages the hardware and grants resources. Uh, there's usually some sort of user interface, whether it's a it might be a um, like a web graphical interface on a on some sort of appliance, or it could be a graphical like the one we're installing with, or it could be command line only, where you have to learn the commands of of whatever shell there that's being used. There's usually a series of services that start up in the background as the system starts and there's usually some, some sort of applications that can be run by the user if they have uh, interactive login on the box and most Linux distributions will use some sort of package management system for controlling what applications are installed and how they're installed and where they go and all that sort of thing. Enterprise Linux, so that's the family of uh, Linux distributions that we'll primarily be focusing on in this. Um, so Red Hat Enpri Enterprise Linux is the one that I've encountered most in my professional career as Linux sysadmin. Uh, that's where if you're going to have something supported most people will go with that. Oracle Linux is um, it's becoming more common now particularly since um, Oracle is uh, providing support. You, they're trying to un undercut Red Hat a bit and they're trying to they usually get into organizations through the DBAs who are already using a lot of Oracle products and they uh, usually will offer cheaper licensing if you uh, using Oracle Linux on the bottom end and uh, you know on the, at the hardware layer and then you're using other whatever Oracle products on top of that and CentOS which is the free one that we're using for this a uh, little bit of the history of it so before 2003 there was one Red Hat distribution Red Hat Linux 
uh, that what one of the issues that they found with that is that their user base was split basically into two main groups. There was the uh, the more hardcore users and developers who wanted latest and greatest software available at all times. Uh, whenever a new version came out upstream, they wanted to um, install it straight away or have it available straight away and have all the uh, the major version increases and things. And the other group of users were the uh, more enterprise business level sort of organizations who wanted to be able to use Red Hat Linux, wanted to get support for it by you know, paying money to a company like Red Hat. Uh, but they didn't want it to be continually getting major version upgrades and changes. They wanted something stable they could work on for for you know some number of years before they have to go and uh, reinstall all their all their operating systems. So that's uh, where Fedora was born, and uh, Red Hat basically split it out into the uh, the free unsupported version Fedora, and uh, the Red Hat Enterprise Linux was the other other option for the businesses. So Fedora comes out with a new version about every six to ten months, and um, that's usually got you know a bit more cutting edge software in it. You've got um, later versions, and it looks a bit prettier usually than Red Hat Enterprise Linux. And uh, Red Hat is it's usually built from every third version, like a major version release of a Red Hat Enterprise Linux is usually made from every third version of Fedora. So Fedora is currently up to version 31, and Red Hat's current Red Hat Enterprise is uh, currently up to version 8. And um, yeah, so every three they'll just they'll just branch it and they'll keep supporting the software that they put into that, making it a long-term support sort of product. Other Linux distributions have done this a little bit differently, rather than split into two products. Like Ubuntu had its uh, long-term service releases every uh, every three releases or so. That, that that release would just continue to be used for an extended period of time. But um, yeah, this is how Red Hat have done it. So what then sprung on from there, because Red Hat released all their software as open source, they are provide, uh, required to provide source code for the um, the packages that they they use and they have installed as part of their install media. So that uh, other organisations have started taking that source code and compiling their own. So the CentOS was one of the early ones to do that. They took the Red Hat source code, stripped out all of the trademark Red Hat materials, the logos and, and all that sort of thing, and put in their own CentOS logos, then recompiled it all. But since it was the same co source code and it's only the logos that have changed, the um, for the most part it's binary compatible. It's, it's pretty much if it'll run on CentOS, it'll run on Red Hat and vice versa. Uh, after a while, Oracle started doing the same. They they uh, basically grabbed the Red Hat source code, started compiling their own versioning and offering support for that, as well as they'll they'll, off, they'll take your money to support Red Hat Linux as well. Uh, they have made a few customizations to Oracle Linux, so they have the option of using the Oracle Unbreakable kernel. Uh, that's what they call it. That's uh, the name of it. Which um, and they've got other customizations in there that are more more optimized towards uh, Oracle products like databases and um, some of their middleware solutions that they run on there. This is what they're currently using on some of their uh, engineered solutions like the um, Exadata. It's running off um, Oracle Linux with Oracle virtualization on it. As of the latest version of of Red Hat. Um, Red Hat have recognised that uh, what a lot of organisations were doing is they were paying for the Red Hat supported versions on their production systems, but for their dev test environments they were using CentOS. I've run into quite a few organisations and through uh, use of contracting and support that um, where somebody will be running CentOS for, for anything that they don't want to pay a lot of money for to try and keep the costs down. And they might have up to you know two thirds of their servers are sandbox dev test boxes and so they'll they'll only pay for the Red Hat support on the one third and um, so what Red Hat have actually done is since they realise that CentOS is part of their, their ecosystem that, that um, they, you know, they've got so many customers that use it, they've brought it into a bit more of a supported environment. They're, they're providing hardware and support and bits and pieces for CentOS to the CentOS developers, but then they're making that upstream of the Red Hat Enterprise Linux. So essentially, before uh, just before a uh, software package or software update goes into Red Hat Enterprise Linux, it would usually roll into CentOS first. So that sort of makes that part of that life cycle uh, that um, you really can use it in that dev test moving through kind of like build baselines through CentOS and then later on through Red Hat. And uh, Oracle can continue doing what they've done for a long time, which is uh, grabbing Red Hat source code and producing Oracle Linux from that. 
Now about virtual machines, we've already been through a bit about this. So they've, they've obviously they they share host resources um, th through. You saw what I was doing with the memory there. How I had 12 gig in this machine. I was allocating two gig for that one particular VM. Uh, the the VM won't necessarily use all of two all of the two gig, depending on uh, virtualization technologies. But often they can have what they call a balloon driver, where they have a an, an application. Well, it looks like an application running within the VM that is actually reclaiming memory and giving it back to the host. That usually only happens when the host is running low on memory. Which we don't have the problem with that here, but when you're running lots of virtual machines, if we run 20 virtual machines on this host, we would start seeing that happening a lot. Uh, you have the ability to share resources. Like I said, you've got, um, rather than running one single operating system, I can run you know loads of them on this one host. Uh, so it's scalable with lower admin costs. So what that means is I can actually build out clusters of, of virtualization hosts. And if you have a, um, a shared data store backing, you can actually shift virtual machines with operating systems between physical hosts while they're still running. And that um, makes it so much easier. Once the operating system is detached from the hardware and the hardware can be upgraded to a new version of the virtualization software without rebooting all the VMs that are dependent on it, just by doing one physical host at a time, you find that it actually becomes a lot cheaper and easier to maintain compliance and you know, uh, keep patches up to date and all that sort of thing. And you can increase your environment just by building another another physical box and adding it into your VM cluster. Uh, reduce downtime. So yeah, you can you can shut down boxes to fix physical things without actually shutting down the VMs. And rapid build and testing. You saw how quick it was to build a a, um, a VM there. It's uh, imagine if you're you've got an application that you need to test rather than actually buying a desktop or buying a, a server to test it on. You can just spin up a bunch of virtual machines and destroy them when you're done. Uh, virtualization vendors. So we're looking at um, VMware is the most common one uh, currently. You'll find the um, most uh, large organizations have a VMware farm of some kind. Um, Oracle's starting to come up a little bit. Like I've worked with, particularly as I said, the Exadatas, uh, Oracle Virtualization, um, uh, Oracle VM is uh, from a price point. Particularly if you're running Oracle databases, is, it can be um, very attractive. So you've started to see a bit more of that. Uh, Microsoft have their Hyper V uh, software solutions. Um, I haven't seen. I've seen a few organisations that do, do use that, but um, it's not as common as as VMware, and it's. Um, more likely to find that in large organizations, even if uh, they have a large Microsoft footprint. And uh, kernel-based based virtual machines. So this is things like the, the Red Hat virtualization is based on KVM, and it's built into pretty much every modern Linux operating system. So back to, we'll see how our virtualization, our VM build is going. <coughs> So it looks like it's going through configuring some of the packages that it's installed. It's gotten past the initial package install process, doing some of the post install stuff. So um, what I might do is just uh, pause the recording, maybe uh, edit out a little bit of this video to um, skip to the part where we can actually reboot it. There's not a lot else that's interesting is happening. You just see in this uh, configuration bit here, the uh, text changing a little bit as it goes through different packages, but there's quite a few there for it to um, go through. Right, so the installation process is finished, it now says it's complete and tells you you should go and reboot and start using it. So let's just hit the reboot button and see what happens. We go back through the boot screen, oh, okay, right. So this is, what this uh, means is it hasn't injected the disk. So some uh, virtualization systems will actually um, Eject the optical disk by default when you when you finish that first installation boot. So before you go into the second one. So what we'll do is we'll close this because that'll power off the virtual machine. <coughs> there we go. And we'll go through and we will modify the storage here. So we've got this um, this here, and we'll just remove it. <coughs> Actually, let me uh, 
I need to eject it, not remove it. There we go, remove disk from virtual drive. Right, now we fire it back up again. And this time, <coughs> we'll find it booting off the hard disk. Right. Um, usually during this boot up process, if it, depending on how long it takes, you can hit the escape button and you can see the services start up. This is actually started up into the graphical environment a bit fast for that. So we've got this um, accepting the license agreement. Yep, it's just GPL version 2. Done on that and finish. And here we go, our first login. Type in here we go. Might as well make it pretty. Let's go full screen mode. Um, this little welcome screen pops up the first time you always pops up the first time you run it. Yep, and then it pops up the help. You can find help in here for the graphical stuff. And the first thing we'll do is just make it look a little bit nicer. Go into settings. You got all the settings for your hardware and software and all, all the um, it's all operating system related stuff. Go under devices, displays. We'll change this to good 1920 by 1080. They're in the list. See how that looks. Is it full screen? Yep. Is a bit missing off the bottom. Oh well, that, that'll do. And we can just click our way around. You've got the um, your dock of favourites over here. I usually get rid of some of these things the first time I run it. Uh, you can get to these just by if you click the activities button or press the Windows key and type. See it comes back up there. Uh, a couple of things I like to include usually text editor. This one's called gedit, <coughs> and uh, maybe a calculator or something. You can put that in there. And I guess the um, yep, that's about it to begin with. Uh, I also like to set some keyboard shortcuts just through settings here go to keyboard and get down to plus sign here and go I'll think of some imaginative names here gnome terminal is the uh, terminal application and we set the shortcut to that to be Windows key plus T equals the super key it's basically the one with the Windows picture on it. Now if I press Windows key plus T, it pops up with the terminal. It makes it a little bit quicker than going finding it in the in the picture. Oops, no, that's not what I meant to do. Uh, next one is GNOME dash calculator. And I usually set that to Windows key plus C for calc. And the next one is I usually set gedit to uh, Windows key plus G. And that's incredibly useful if you're on the phone and you're 
doing something with one hand and you need something, you need to take some notes in a hurry, you can take stuff there, save it somewhere. Uh, now, just a little bit on the, just, we'll go to files here, just to show you a little bit of this. This is your home directory. Uh, I usually like, to, don't like that view, I prefer this one. Just click the button up over here to change it. And I usually like to set a few preferences in here. Just going to, it's up here at the files menu, go down to preferences. And I usually go sort folders before files. Allow folders to be expanded. And that's that's about it. So now we can see you can expand them out. There's usually nothing in these to start off with until we start throwing things in there. Uh, a couple of other desktop uh, integrate like first steps I usually do. Um, I'll go through in the next video a little bit about RPMs and and uh, how to install your first packages. So I'll leave those out. I'll put for the next one we'll, we'll throw on Chrome and VLC and a couple of others as, as a demonstration. But um, from here, you open up your web browser and click around, you can start browsing the net and doing useful and interesting things. Uh, we'll wrap up this video here and in the next one, as I said, we'll cover it. The first thing a person wants to do usually is install applications, so we'll do that in the next video.